All right, so we're going to start off with the skeletal system. We have 206 bones, but when we're born, we have over 300 because they fuse to make our 206 bones. Now, we're going to look at the elements of the skeletal system. It's not just our bones, but also different types of connective tissue like cartilage and ligaments. We have two different skeletons, if you think about it. We have our axial skeleton, which goes down the middle of our axis. It's going to be our skull, our spine, and our rib cage. And then we have our appendicular skeleton, which is our appendixes, right? Our, our, our appendages, sorry, our appendages, which is going to be our hips and our legs, ultimately our arms and legs. These two skeletons together, right, support our weight and protect our internal organs. If you look at it, what organs in there? Brain, that's protecting, right? The organs that are inside of our rib cage are our lung and heart. And then also within our pelvic cavity, we have our reproductive organs like our uterus and other important organs for the reproduction of offspring. Now, along with bones, we have cartilage. You'll see that there is cartilage that connects the ends of our ribs, which is bone, to our sternum. We have cartilage in between our vertebrae. We think those are the discs that you, we refer to. We also have a little bit of cartilage in between our pubic bones. And we have articular cartilage that is on the edges of the bones that rub up against other bones within our joints. And this cartilage protects us uh, specifically in highly movable joints uh, from bones rubbing up against bones causing osteoarthritis. As we get older, the more that this cartilage runs, uh, rubs away, uh, the more we have bone-to-bone -bone contact, and that's when we have what's called osteo, which refers to bones. Arthritis, arth refers to joint, osteo refers to bones. Itis, which refers to inflammation. Uh, inflammation. So inflammation of the joints due to the rubbing of our bones, right? That's what osteoarthritis is. What is a joint? Well, a joint is where we have two bones meet. Now, some joints allow for uh, lots of movement, some allow for little movements, and some allow for no movement. And so we'll look at the different types of joints, okay? We have different types of joints in the next slide. Now, what we don't see is actually in our skull, if you look at our skull, right, we have these like things called sutures, okay? That's actually a joint where two of our, I'm looking at the top of my skull down, uh, that would be like an immovable joint. But if we look at these other types of joints, like the joints in our wrists and ankles, those are called plane joints because they kind of slide to, on each other at specific planes. Your elbow and your knee is a hinge joint because it works kind of like the hinge uh, in a door. Uh, this is your humerus right here, your arm bone, and then this is your radius and ulna. Uh, they pivot and swivel like if you were to put your foot on the ground and twist it. This is the most movement, most range of movement is a ball and socket. This would be like your arm and your hip, right? Where your arm attaches to your shoulder. Saddle joint, this is your thumb. It's very unique because only the thumb has a saddle joint. And then in your knuckles, we have these unique things called condyloid joints based on the shape of one bone and the shape of another, how it fits in. Ligaments. Now... This is not a ligament because it connects a muscle to a bone, right? Now, a ligament is in here. A ligament, this is your ACL, anterior cruciate ligament. It is connecting the femur, this bone, to the tibia, this bone. This is bone to bone. So if you look at your ankle, right? Okay, you have the fibula. This is the fibula right here, the outside. And it's being connected to the calcaneus or the heel bone by a ligament. Okay, bone to bone. When you, rub your, when you roll your ankles, you typically stretch these out and they become really swollen and inflamed. That's what happens when you sprain an ankle. Bones are alive. They they're literally have cells that produce... Uh, products that can be excreted out that actually make the hard part of the bone. Now, inside of our bones is where we make red blood cells, and we'll talk about that. That's called our bone marrow. But the outside, the hard part, is actually composed of two different types of bone. Compact bone, which is this part. See, it's really, really dense. 
That part's the compact bone. And then spongy bone, which is going to be this part right here. So spongy bone, which is not as compact, right, is where you'll find a lot of our bone marrow. And there's two different types of bone marrow. Oops. Okay. We have red bone marrow, red marrow, which produces our blood cells. And then kind of in throughout here, a lot of the times we have what's called yellow marrow, which is just pretty much fat storage. Think of like fat as being a yellowish color. And if you notice the spongy bone, guys, it's, it's kind of porous, has holes. It's not as thick as the compact bone. It allows our bones to be strong, yet, yet light, because it's not so solid. Now, what we know about our bones when we're born is that it's mainly cartilage when we're born. And then it churns to bone in a process called calcification where we add calcium to our bone. It becomes ossified. Okay? And so over time, our bones get longer, and they go and turn into the hard part that you see today. You can see, here's the fetus, guys. See that curvature I told you guys about? Shaped like a C. All this stuff right in here is all cartilage. Cartilage. It hasn't become hardened yet as into bone. So this process is called calc calcification. There are two types of bone cells. Okay, ones that build bone and ones that break it down. Osteo refers to bone. Blasts. Now you think a blast is like breaking things down, but actually think of the blast, the B in blasts, building. Osteoblasts build bone and osteoclasts, guess what they do? Yeah, they break it down. This is build. I think of C as like... Think of bone crushing and bone building. They don't really crush the bone, but they shave off the bone. Oops. They shave it apart and release calcium into the blood. Okay. So those are the two cells. You think of like putting mud on a wall to build up a wall and then shaving that mud off, right? Uh, to make, make that wall thinner. That's what those cells do. Calcium is the ion that is deposited into our bones. We have our strongest bones when we're 18 to 30. This is a normal healthy bone if we're looking at the spongy bone. Look what happens to grandma's spongy bone as she gets older. Now, grandpa happens to him too, but for ladies, for you, it happens a lot quicker because of the hormone changes through menstruation. And so you lose a lot of the calcification. So if this is really de uh, we if this is less dense, when you fall, there's a greater chance of breaking these bones. Okay, so you definitely don't want this to happen. So make sure you, you know, you're eating lots of calcium and having a healthy diet. Uh, there's also medication that can prevent this from happening as well. Muscular system. Moving on. So the muscular system actually has more than just the function of movement. It also allows us to push food throughout our body because of the smooth muscle. It also opens our blood vessels, dilates them, and constricts them. It also generates heat. We have over 600 plus muscles. Muscle cells have lots of mitochondria because muscle cells, in order to contract, need a lot of ATP. And we know that sugar plus oxygen in our mitochondria produces ATP. And in that process, a lot of heat is released. So that's one way that we can regulate body temperature. This is shivering right when you shiver when you're cold now cells can only contract so if this is a muscle cell right when it contracts it gets smaller a cell muscle cell cannot elongate or get longer and the way that they produce movement we'll talk about in a second three types of muscle you'll need to know that the first muscle is cardiac muscle this is your heart You'll notice that the cells are branched, right? They kind of are branching. Uh, they have these stripes called striations. And they have these other structures called intercalated discs that we'll talk about later. Skeletal muscle, pretty simple, attached to the skeleton, right? So this is one right here. This is two right here. These are two. It's attached to the skeleton. And this is mainly for movement. And then smooth muscle, you'll find inside 
of a lot of our hollow organs like our esophagus, small intestines, stomach, also in our blood vessels, which allow for uh, our vessels to get from this size, right? Here's a blood vessel. If it opens up and dilates, it can be much larger, right? Muscles do that. Or we can go from this size and even get smaller. That's called constriction, right? We look at our skeletal muscles. Notice that they have more than one nucleus. They have lots of mitochondria, and they're attached to our bones by something called a tendon, not a ligament. And they're nice and kind of stacked in these long cylindrical columns uh, called muscle fibers, where a muscle fiber is the same as a muscle cell. So this right here, right, is one long muscle cell, this whole thing right there. A tendon, like we said before, attaches our muscles to bones. Where a muscle attaches is called the point of origin. Okay, that's where uh, it attaches to the bone that doesn't move. This is the humerus. Doesn't move. Now, I, th I, this is a bicep. We're talking about the bicep. The bicep attaches to the humerus. That's the humerus. Oops. Can't really see that. Sorry. So here's your tendon. Here's your tendon. This doesn't move. Now, this is, right, the radius and the ulna. It's attached to the radius. When this shortens... This moves up like this. So anytime you have the angle getting smaller, the angle right here, right? Let's about, you know, look about 100 degrees. When it gets smaller, when we go from this to this, that is a flexor, right? It's flexing, getting smaller. Now, the triceps would be right here. Point of origin, point of insertion. There'd be a tendon insertion here. So here's your triceps. When these guys shorten, it pulls the bone that way and extends. That's an extensor or extender. Okay, and that's what those muscles do. We have two types of muscle fibers, muscle cells in our muscles. Fast twitch, which they, you know, respond to really quick jerky movements, and slow twitch, which can have slow sustained contractions this guy is a marathon runner this guy is a sprinter okay so we'll call this guy person one and person two who of the two have lots of fast twitch fibers yeah fast twitch this is slow twitch not that this individual is slow and this individual is fast although they probably is but it has to do with the ability for those muscle fibers um to either contract quickly or slowly now, smooth muscle is what we'll find in the inner linings of a lot of our digestive organs, okay? This is not under what we call voluntary control, unlike our skeletal muscles, where I myself can control their contractions. You cannot tell food to pass through your esophagus, okay, through the process called peristalsis, right? The movement. So, if... This is my digestive tract, and this is food. There are literally like wave-like contractions that propel food from your esophagus to your stomach, stomach to small intestine, and so on. So the muscle fibers wrap in this direction, right, around, and they also go in a longitudinal. They also wrap in this direction. We also have cardiac muscle, remember, right? This is only found in the heart. And uses huge amounts of ATP because it's always contracting. There are these intercalated discs right here. They're like little doorways in between each heart muscle cell that allows all of the cells to communicate at once. It's very important for our heart cells to communicate at once because they have to contract at the same time in order for our heart to beat in rhythm, right? So there's these gap junctions, these doorways that allow the ions to flow in and out so our heart contracts in one beat. Okay, so how does a muscle contraction work? Well, let's look at the anatomy of a muscle itself. It's like a case full of packages of straws. So here's my case. Here's a package, and inside of the package has a bunch of straws. Another package of straws. 
another package of straws, right? The muscle is the case. The package of straws is what's called the fascicle. The straws themselves, those are muscle fibers or muscle cells. Now think of the straw. Now look inside of the straw. Inside of the straw are individual tiny little protein rods called myofibrils. And even within those are even smaller protein microfilaments called actin and myosin. When I look at the smallest level of these tiny, tiny protein filaments, one of them being actin, this is called the thin filament, and the other one is myosin, that's this one right here, that's the thick filament, right? So this is the thick one, myosin, and actin, so this is actin right here, right here, and this is myosin. They cling to each other, and the heads right here, this guy right here is this guy up here, and this right here is this guy right here, and they latch onto each other and slide across like this. They slide, and that so they attach and slide, and that causes the muscle to contract and shorten. Now, you'll notice in this diagram right here, the little cone that's flying in right here, see this guy right there, boop, that is... ATP. So in order for us to contract our muscle cells, we need ATP. See this little circle guy right here? Whoop, that guy right there coming in and bonding and moving away the binding site? That is going to be calcium. So it's important for calcium and ATP to work together for our muscles to contract, right? And so we, that's how we burn a lot of calories by muscle contractions because you need a lot of ATP in order for this to happen. Skin is known as the integumentary system. It includes our skin, our hair, and our nails. And within our skin, we have oil glands, known as the sebaceous glands, and sweat glands. The main function of the skin, to be honest, is more like the immune system. It helps protect our body by providing a layer between us and the outside world. But it also helps regulate things like salt balance and eliminates uh, waste and really controls our body temperature. So it really ma helps maintain homeostasis. So the skin has multiple functions. Skin has two, um, two main layers and then a bottom layer, which is mainly fat. So we can think of it as three layers. But the skin itself has the epidermis and then the dermis. Epi means like above. So it's the top layer. If you've ever been to a dermatologist, derm means skin. So the outermost layer, the epidermis, is this top part. And it contains pores, which are openings. We have hair, pores that hair comes out of, and we have pores that sweat comes out of. So if you look at the epidermis, it's mainly dead skin cells. And if you remember from the video, we're constantly regenerating our epidermis, right? Every couple of weeks, we're getting like a new top layer of skin. Helps protect us from the constant wear and tear our skin has to deal with. Our skin produces protective proteins. Keratin is the protein that's produced by keratinocytes that gives us that tough thickness of our skin. If you've ever had a callus from like uh, working out or if you have rings, that thickness of your skin is produced by keratin. This is also the stuff that's, that it, your hair is made up of and your nails are made up of. This is a thick, thick protein. The other protection is from melanin, right? If you ever heard of melanoma, skin cancer, it's because these sites, right, these cells right here that produce the dark pigment that gives your skin its tan color, these absorb UV radiation so that the DNA and all the other cells don't get microwaved from that energy. So the more melanin we have in our skin, right, the darker our skin becomes, and that's that tanning effect. Some people are born with more melanocytes within their skin is other, others because of their genetics, and that's why you have the different range of skin color. The bottom layer, or the middle layer, I guess, but the, the main layer of our skin is called the dermis, and this is where all the nerves, this is where our hair follicles are, this is where our sweat glands are, this is where most of our blood vessels are, this is the main part of our skin, right? The dermis. It's, it's the thickest part. 
Our dermis is made up of elastic fibers, which gives our skin its stretchy quality, and collagen fibers, which gives our skin a lot of its firmness. We can actually get this stuff injected in our lips, right? So that it gives that firmness because collagen and elastin starts to break down when we get older, and that's what forms wrinkles. This protein, we produce less and less of it over time. So our, our skin is not as swollen and firm, and it doesn't stretch out and become tight and smooth. Sweat glands are right here, okay? A sweat gland is separate from a hair follicle, whereas when, uh, in this case, where when it secretes its water, it comes out of a, a pore just for sweat. And so if we have all these sweat glands, we have all the sweat that releases water, and when the water is now on the surface of our skin and it evaporates, it draws the heat that's stored in our blood and draws it out. So the main purpose of sweat is to control body temperature. If you've ever come out of the shower when you're wet, that water on the surface of your skin draws and sucks the heat out. It, it feels very cold. Sebaceous glands refers to oil. Notice that our sebaceous glands are connected directly to our hair follicle. That's why your hair is oily. Because the oil gets implanted directly into the hair follicle. So this is the oil gland. These are different types of sweat glands. There are some sweat glands that um, actually mix with the oil, right, in specific parts of your body. And so that is why the oil comes out directly into your hair gland. Uh, if you have too much oil production, then these the bacteria can get clogged into these hair follicles. And that's where you'll get things like acne. But the purpose of oil is not only to lubricate the skin and keep it waterproof because, you know, oil and water don't mix, but it also helps preventing bacteria from entering into our body. Now, sub refers to below, whereas epi or hi, uh, hyper uh, refers to above. Cutaneous, like if you think of, uh, think of like your, your cuticle almost, but the word cutaneous refers to our skin. So if you think of sub below cutaneous skin, below our skin we have fat. That's that third and final layer. And this just and this is going to be on top of what's underneath our skin, guys. Underneath our fat is going to be what? Muscle. Muscle. So the reason for this fat is to directly provide nutrients for the one part of our body that needs the most energy, and that's our muscles. But if we have too much subcutaneous fat, then that's when you see people that are obese, right? 